Well, today we are going to be looking at an Old Testament story concerning two different women, in fact, who were very instrumental in protecting uh, the very person that God had called to lead the people of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. Of course, the person being protected, if you know your Bible, is Moses. And then the two women most responsible for keeping him alive in his early years were Jochebed, his his mother, and Miriam, Moses' sister. Uh, We're going to camp out in Exodus 2 today, so if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, there are a few in the chairs below. If you've got an iPhone or Android or iPad, feel free to use something like version. Uh, There's Bibles out on the Welcome Center. If you'd like one to take home, feel free to grab those. But if you want to follow along, we're going to be in Exodus Exodus chapter 2 primarily. And and in Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2, that's where, as we read the Bible, we see what Jochebed and Miriam did to help Moses live. And and if you don't know, we're in a series here. We're studying some incredible women of the Bible, women of faith, and we'll be studying these through into the beginning of September. And, And I'm just excited to be able to preach these to you. I think there's so much that we can draw on from these wonderful ladies. And in this story, as we're reading it in in Exodus 2, uh, the people of Israel, if you know your background, had come to Egypt in order to escape famine in their own land, right? And uh, Joseph had been sold by his brothers into slavery. If you remember, you know, Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Joseph, right? Uh, Joseph gets sold into slavery. He's got this up and down, up and down, up and down story. But eventually, he comes into a position of incredible power in the nation of Egypt. And, and after uh, becoming Pharaoh's right-hand man and interpreting Pharaoh's dream, he says, you know, Pharaoh, where well, there's going to be seven years of prosperity, but after that, there's going to be seven years of famine. And so the Egyptians wisely listen to him. They begin to store up all their, all their excess crops. And when that famine comes, all of a sudden, they're the only one with food. They're the only one with resources. They're the only ones who had had really prepared for this long season of famine. And the result of that is then, if you know your story, then Joseph's family eventually migrates their way into Egypt and they settle there and are blessed as they live there. We, we see that they increase greatly in number. In Exodus 1240, it tells us that they lived in Egypt as a people for 430 long years. And most of those years were really good years. Uh, the, the Israelites prospered. The Israelites did great. They, they, they grew in number. They were successful. Everything went really well for most of those 430 years. But in Exodus 1.8, we read that a, a new king comes into power in Egypt. And you see, this new king, for some reason, he didn't know what Joseph had done for Egypt. And instead of seeing the Israelites as a friend, he looks around and he sees them as an enemy. In Exodus 1.9, it says the king's comments. It says, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. See, he saw how the Israelites had begun to prosper. And he worried that one day these Israelites might become so powerful that they might ally themselves with their enemies, with Egypt's enemies, and, and join in with them and overthrow Egypt and take Egypt for themselves. He was afraid that they might be part of an attack against his nation. And and just to give you an idea uh, of how much the Israelites had grown, when Jacob and his sons moved to Egypt, there was a total of 70 family members, 70 family members. In the second year after the Exodus, after they leave Egypt, the Bible tells us that there were 603,550 males. So we're talking million and a half or two million total Israelites when you start adding women and children. Because those males that were being counted were 20 years of age and older. So the Israelites, they've been doing good, right? That's a lot of growth. And so because of his fears, the Pharaoh does three different things. First, he takes away the freedom that the Israelites had. You see, Pharaoh sees them, he's worried because all the nations that invade Egypt come through the very place where these guys have been living. He's worried. And so he puts masters over them to oppress them, forcing them into labor. His goal was, if I make them work hard enough, I will weaken them. I'll take away their physical strength and I will crush their spirits. 
certainly, if I work them hard enough, they'll quit multiplying, right? That's, that's kind of what he's thinking. But that's not what happened. Instead of being crushed, the Bible tells us that the people grew stronger and they increased in number. And as a result, he forces them to work even harder. He makes them, you've got to make bricks and you've got to work the land. But the more that he oppressed them, the more they grew. Why is that? Well, when you try to oppress the people who have a strong sense of purpose, you see, they become even more determined. Even if they can't fight back directly, they become determined not to break. You see, adversity can draw us to God and give us a, a supernatural toughness that enables us to face the tough times that we might experience with God's help. Now, because his first plan fails, Pharaoh devises a new one. So he called in all of the Hebrew midwives. These are the ladies who help the women give birth. And he tells all these midwives, whenever you see a baby boy born, your job now is to kill that baby. Go on your way. That's what Pharaoh tells them. But you see, these midwives, while they feared Pharaoh, they feared God a whole lot more. He thought they would slowly exterminate all the males, leaving only the, the weaker females, f- female slaves, and they would be easy to you know, take care of and not have to worry about them rising up against his nation. No big problem, right? But the midwives refused to do it. And as a result, God intends for them to continue to multiply, and what he does is they grow again, right? All of a sudden, Pharaoh says, you're supposed to kill all the boys, and he's looking around, and he's like, there's more. How is this happening? What's going on here? So his second plan fails miserably. But Pharaoh is a persistent guy. We know that from scripture. He wasn't quite ready to give up yet. And so he says, I've got one more plan. He says, new law. This is the law of the land. New law. He said, I know I've got to get rid of these Hebrew people somehow. I've got to get rid of the Hebrew males at least. And so what he does is he creates a new law, orders it all across the land that every single male that is born to a Hebrew woman, those baby boys must be thrown into the Nile River. Hmm. Quite the leadership. How many babies died this way? We don't know. But this leads us then into the, the story of the birth of Moses. You see, there's this Levite woman, her name is Jochebed, and she gives birth to a son, Exodus 2.2 2 says, that the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Many scholars believe that this word beautiful in Hebrew meant that his beauty was seen as a, a particular token of divine approval, a sign that God had a, a special plan for this baby boy. Acts uh, 7.20, where we read of Stephen's sermon, it says this about Moses. It says that he was lovely in the sight of God. The phrase literally meaning lovely to God or lovely looking as if he were God. Now because of the, the Pharaoh's edict that all males were to be thrown into the Nile River, after giving birth, Jochebed hides this beautiful little baby boy for three months. How was she able to do this? How do you hide a baby boy for three months? I don't know, right? I mean, maybe she showed up for work with a pillow under her dress, right? I'm not quite sure. How she pulled it off, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But regardless of how she was making this work, eventually somebody's going to figure out, you've been really pregnant for about a year now. Right? And eventually this thing's going to pop, right? What's up with you? Why is your number different than everybody else? And somebody's going to figure it out eventually. And so that could be a problem, of course. What they would do then is know she'd had given birth and they'd go find this little baby boy and they'd kill him. Possibly kill her and her family as well for disobeying the law. So Jochebed decides to get a little creative. If Pharaoh wants her child to be thrown in the river, that's where she's going to put him, right? But not before she gives her son a little competitive edge. 
She wants to give her son a little bit of an advantage in life. So she and her husband, they build a little boat for him. They, they, they take a, make a basket out of reeds. They, they cover it with pitch so that it would stay floating. She places the boat carefully down into the reeds. She doesn't like throw it out in the middle of the Nile River and let the, let, you know, the, the course take it away. She doesn't put him in the middle of the current. She doesn't row out in a boat or anything like that. Right on the edge where the water goes slow through the reeds placing it where well, maybe somebody might find it, right? Makes sense to me. Jochebed had done an awful lot of planning to make sure that her child survived. Eventually, as we read the story, Pharaoh's daughter comes wandering by that day, and she sees this basket with this little baby boy, and he's a beautiful baby boy, and she feels sorry for him. Now, while this is going on, Moses' sister, she's kind of hiding out, right? Moses' sister is, is, is just over here a little bit away from the basket, hiding out, watching what's going on. And when Pharaoh's daughter goes down to this basket, she goes up to the Pharaoh's daughter and says, Hey, uh, I see you found a baby boy, right? Uh, would you like me to go find a Hebrew woman to wean it for you? You know, somebody who could take care of this baby for you. Pharaoh's daughter goes, Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Go ahead and do that. And so she goes and gets her mother, which is Moses' mother as well, and she gets to then go on and continue raising this baby boy. I mean, who would have known that years later this baby boy would come to be the one who would bring freedom to all of the Israelites? You see, while Pharaoh was planning to exterminate them, God was preparing to free them. The two people, as I've mentioned, that I want to focus in on today are, are Jochebed and Miriam, the mother and sister of Moses. As we review this wonderful story, both of these great women play uh, an amazing, significant role in Moses' life and keeping Moses alive. Uh, we'll talk about Jochebed first, if you're taking notes there and you're following along. And, and as you read and as you study Jochebed, you, you see she has this overpowering love to take care of and to protect Moses. And she has two qualities that every man, woman, and child of God should possess. And the very first one is, she had a great respect for human life. You see, Jochebed looks down into these beautiful babies' newborn eyes and can't bear the thought of his death, of course, as his mother. And so she takes her baby boy, she puts him in this basket, and she sends him on down the river. And can you imagine how her heart must have broken as she had to, even though she'd done all this preparation... Let that basket go. How hard was that for her? But she knew she had to protect her son from Pharaoh. And she knew that if saving his life meant setting him free here, then so be it. That's what she was going to do and trust God in it. But she did everything she could to protect Moses' life regardless of what the cost was. And I want you to notice something about Jochebed's love for Moses that attests to her faith in God. You see, not once, but twice does she have to give Moses up. Twice this mother has to give, Joseph, or give Moses away. The first time, as I mentioned, she's at the Nile River and she's got to set him free. She'd, she'd been hired and she'd, she'd all this other stuff that comes, but she doesn't know it at this moment as she's letting that basket go. She doesn't know if there's an alligator down the way. She doesn't know if there's a hippopotamus. If you don't know about the Nile River, this is a river with lots of dangerous wildlife, right? The highest concentration of alligators and hippopotamuses in the world are in the Nile River. There's some big animals there. And there's all sorts of other bad stuff that can, of course, happen. Once you let go of that basket, you've lost control. And so that's the first time. But she has to do it a second time as well. Two different times she has to give him away. The second time had to be just as hard as the first time, but she knew that she was giving him up into God's hands. And she had to trust that God would look after him when she fully gives him over into Pharaoh's household. That would be the second time she has to give up her son. You see, most mothers will do just about anything, right? It's the unwritten part of the job description. That's why you don't, when you see a mama bear or you see bear cubs, you don't get between the bear cubs and the mama bear, right? You don't even have to be threatening those cubs. Bad things happen if you get between mama bear and her cub. Well, you don't want to get between a mom and her cub either, right? Her child. 
Mothers are protectors, naturally. Mothers are there to chase the boogeyman from under our beds late at night, right? Mothers are there to make sure that we look both ways before we cross the street. Mothers are there to tell us when we're making stupid mistakes and everyone else is afraid to tell us or hurting our feelings. Irma Bombeck once wrote this about being a mother. She said, the easiest part about being a mother is giving birth. She said, the hardest part is showing up for it each and every day. Jochebed knew what it was to be a good mother. The second quality that she possessed was she had great respect for spiritual life. You see, Jochebed did everything that she could possibly to ensure that her son wouldn't drown in the water. She gave Moses everything he needed physically in that way. But she didn't stop there. You see, she wanted to make sure he had an understanding of who he was and where he came from. Moses had a heritage. Moses knew that he was a Jew, right? That eventually is what makes him have to flee the nation. He ends up killing a man because of a fight, because of the mistreatment of another Jew. So Moses knows fundamentally who he is. And how did he come to know that? He comes to know that through Jochebed. She had to have taught him in those early years where she was caring for him in the Pharaoh's household. Maybe she was the one who got to tell him the stories about the great men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. But here's the point. Jochebed loves her son so much that she ensures that he knows who his God is. She wanted him to know that he had a purpose in life. She wanted him to know that he was valuable to God. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.10 about Christians. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, we too need to know that we serve a great and awesome God and that, that God has a purpose and a value on our lives as well. Just like Moses, God has a plan for you. A vision for each and every one of us to follow. Now, maybe you won't be leaving, leading millions of Israelites, but you'll be leading somebody somewhere someday. God has a plan for you. And there was one final point about Jochebed. She was rewarded for her faith. You see, after putting him in the Nile, she was able to shortly thereafter come into the care and protection under Pharaoh's daughter for her son. The first three months of Moses' life, she, of course, cared for him at home on her own, and that was on her own expense. But then, after Pharaoh's daughter finds this beautiful baby boy floating in a basket in the river, she gets to get paid to raise her own son. Awesome. Right? How many of you moms would have said, sign me up, you know, where's that check for raising my kids? Kids are expensive. They say anywhere from a quarter to a half million dollars per child to raise a child, right? That's what it's in today's finances going to cost to raise a child through college. That's a lot of coin. And if you were to tell me that you would pay me to take care of my son, I'd still probably say no because I don't think I'm cut out for it, but my wife would probably say yes. (laughs) I don't think I would make it. It'd have to be a big paycheck. I don't think I could do it. So thank you, moms and women, for your wonderful work. But she gets paid, right? She gets put on Pharaoh's staff to raise this beautiful little baby boy who just happens to be her own son, right? What a wonderful thing. She gets to be there. She gets to be there as he's named. She gets to help him with his education. She gets to tell him about her people and the nation. She gets to teach him about the history of Egypt, about all the different things that he's going to need to know. She's there for those early years to make the difference in his life. What a wonderful blessing that is. What a, what a God kind of thing that is. And I believe that He knew who he was because she had taught him and raised him spiritually. And we see that, that Moses is unwilling then later in his life to put aside his spiritual base. So Jochebed has this great respect for human life and spiritual life, but then God rewards her in such an amazing way with this great opportunity. 
The other woman in the story, of course, is Miriam, right? Joseph's, or I keep saying Joseph, I don't know why I say that. Moses' sister. Notice what God says about Miriam. This comes from Micah 6.4. It says, indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Did you catch that? See, a lot of times in the Bible, it talks about all these male leaders, right? It doesn't always mention the ladies. But here Micah goes out of his way to make sure we understand that Miriam, she was a big deal. Puts her at the same level as the guy who led the exodus, the biggest event in the history of all of history of Israel, and his brother, and also Miriam, right? Micah doesn't forget her. That's a big deal as far as scripture goes. He didn't say just before Moses and Aaron. He includes her. And let me just give you a moment of an aside, a, a point I think that's important to make. I believe in the church of Jesus Christ as a whole needs to, overall, we need to be a little bit better at recognizing the gifts that women possess in the church. I think we do a pretty good job here locally, but I think church universal, we got some work still to do. Because as we look at the Bible, we see at key times God using women in such important and wonderful and amazing ways. So praise God for you, ladies. This isn't Mother's Day, but thanks. You've been such an important part of the history, the Bible, this church, and every church. Amazing women like Miriam, Deborah, Ruth, Esther, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and some of the other women we're going to continue on studying for the next few weeks. And I believe that that Miriam does more to shape the identity of the nation of Israel than most people ever realize. And there's two passages that are are, are clearly showing us the effect that Miriam has in her role in Egypt. Exodus 2 and Exodus 15 are where you'll find those. Now there was, if you know the story of Miriam, there's kind of a dark side to Miriam, right? We know that along with Aaron, they have a season of being knuckleheads, right? They rebel against Moses, and they do some stuff that I'm sure... If they wrote it in their diary, they would burn that diary so nobody else would find out what they had done. But that's for a different day, for a different sermon. This passage today shows that Miriam's perseverance and protection of Moses as a baby were critical. You see, in the story, Miriam would have been a young woman, 12, maybe 14 years of age. And when Pharaoh had ordered the drowning of all the Hebrew boys in the Nile River, Moses' mother takes him down in this basket and and floats him away. It's Miriam who's there watching, right? It's not Jochebed. It's not mom who gets to watch this basket float away. Mom has to leave. Miriam, she goes over here. She's a little distance off. She's kind of keeping her eye on that basket for mom, right? She's following that basket as it floats down the river, as it goes through the reeds. She's keeping her eye on it just to make sure, right? To see what would happen. And when that basket arrives at the feet of the Pharaoh's daughter, a princess, right? When it gets to her feet, Miriam watches. You can imagine the anguish she had before it got there. And when the right time comes, as Pharaoh's daughter approaches that basket, out pops Miriam, right? Like, walking up. Hey, what's going on, ladies? Oh, you found a baby. Oh, look at that. It's a Hebrew baby. How about I go find you somebody to, who can feed this baby, right? Who can take care of this baby? How about, I, how, how, how about I go get one of your servant ladies, the Egyptian servants, the Israelites? How about I go get you one who could nurse this child, who would raise him up? Pharaoh's daughter's like, yeah, that sounds like a swell deal. Go do it, right? And notice how shrewd Miriam is in this process. She understands the stakes, and she shows up, and if she shows up and says, oh, hey, look, you found my baby brother. Should I go get mom? What? Pharaoh's daughter's going to be like, kill her now, right? And go find her mom and take them out too. But no, she's shrewd. 
Miriam shows up and says, oh, look, you found a beautiful baby boy. Look, he's a handsome little guy, isn't he? Huh? It might be that I could go find you somebody to take care of him if you wanted to keep him. Would you like that? Pharaoh's daughter has no clue there's a relationship here. And so, yeah, that would be great, Miriam. Go find us a lady. And as a result of that, as a result of her faithfulness, as a result of her courage, as a result of her work, Moses is adopted into probably the most powerful family in the world at that time. And because of what she does, Moses will then be raised by a Hebrew woman with a Hebrew identity. See, there was other women they could have gotten who were probably Egyptians. There were other Egyptian women who'd recently had babies that could have fed that boy. But she wisely suggests a Hebrew woman. So she shows maturity and brilliance. And this whole amazing chain of events that eventually will lead to millions of Israelites possessing their promised land comes on the faith and effort of this young woman. So what is the application then for us? Well, simply it's this. A wise Christian will be driven by a keen sense of identity as he or she lives out our lives for Jesus. Now, the very first question we need to ask as we walk with Jesus is simply, who are we? Do we understand fundamentally that we are the children of God, that we are children of the King of all kings, that we, we are the children of a God who has ensured that we have a destiny and a purpose, that a, a God who has called us, a God who has equipped us? Do we understand that? And if we do, and we should, and if we understand that, we should never forget the importance of the quality of character. Having things like courage, having things like perseverance, having things like faith. Incredibly important to us. You see, a Christian, for us, our wisdom is in committing to doing the right thing no matter the cost. It's easy to buckle under pressure in this life and in this world. But as Christians, we need to be stronger. We need to follow through in faith and trust in God, no matter what that risk might be. As we're reading scripture, the second glimpse that we get of Miriam is by the shores of the Red Sea. This comes later in her life as she's a mature woman. And we see in scripture, Miriam is this, this inspirational leader among women. And we know that the Bible says that Miriam was a prophetess. And it seemed that she'd become a leader of, of the women in the, in the Israelite nation. Exodus 15.20 says, Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand and all of the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. Why does that matter? Well, this comes on the heels. The Israelites had just literally crossed the Red Sea. They had made it through the sea safely. They were now free. The waters had come. It had crashed over Pharaoh's army. It had wiped them out. They're standing on the shores. They're watching this. They're going, wow, we're free. And all of a sudden, Miriam gets up, starts singing, starts dancing, makes music, starts praising the Lord, right? And as she's doing it, she's basically repeating something Moses has said earlier at the beginning of Exodus 15. And it says in Exodus 15, 21, Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has hurtled into the sea. What an amazing song and story. Think about it. They're not going to get to enter the promised land still for another 40 years. And yet she has the wisdom to stop and pause and recognize something big just happened and we need to praise God. I mean, think about the story. That isn't what they had been doing. All along the way, they're like, Moses, you led us to this ocean, this sea. Now we're trapped. Army's coming. We're all going to die. It's your fault. Right? Right? That's the early stages of Egyptian of uh, Israelite whining. And then they spend the next 40 years after this whining and blaming and complaining. But not Miriam. Miriam knows they have been delivered. And so she thanks God. 
and says, come on, join in, let's go. Raise your hands, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord. That's what she does. And in this passage, there's so much rich symbolism. The story of Moses being in the water and then being rescued reminds us of God rescuing his people out of the water and rescuing us, in fact, by water. It reminds us of a, of a much larger basket we call Noah's Ark, right? Which gave life to Noah and his family because Noah remained faithful to God. And later, the, the, the Red Sea would be a body of water used to rescue the Israelites, of course, and then destroy the army as we were studying today. So we see it there. And later, it's this helpless baby boy born in Bethlehem who was baptized and then came up out of the Jordan River. The one who would save man from his sin. It is the water that is used in baptism to, to signify symbolically by our coming, going down in the water and coming back out of the water that we too have been rescued, we too have been cleansed, that we have put death behind us. And the very, very same God who came and rescued the Israelites, the very same God of the man named Moses, of the woman named Jochebed, of the girl named Miriam, is the very same God we worship today. His plan for this world includes you and me, and nothing can change his love and plan for you. Perhaps you've been going through something challenging in your life recently. Perhaps the world just seems to be moving too fast, or you've been struggling, or there's been pain. Perhaps you feel like you've been pushed out into the water, and the water just feels a little bit too deep and the current is just a little bit too strong. Remember that God wants to rescue you. That indeed, God has rescued you if you're willing to be rescued. But you have to respond to him by faith. Have you been rescued? That is the question of the day. Let's pray.